All right, so here we are. We're going to talk about chapters six and seven in, in part two. Um, so uh, what I want to start with is that that party meeting, right? That's this this reprehensible party meeting and that whole. There we are. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. The whole Hi, Michael. concept of the danger of over idealism, um, and what your uh what you were thinking about when 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 you read this uh the, this 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 speech and this discussion is that the quote about the uh, getting drunk and losing your head um, well, the danger, the idea of the danger of over idealism, comrades, a grave new danger has been growing among us in the last year. I call it the danger of over idealism. All right. So what is going on here with, um, with this propaganda? Seems very pointed towards Andre. Oh, you think yes. so that his ideas aren't aren't welcome anymore? His his pure ideological principles aren't welcome in the party anymore. And yeah, so so they're shifting the ground and and and, and uh, redefining and recategorizing mainly with the intent of drumming him out. Right. Right. This is the. Yeah, part I think I, I think Andre is doomed. Yeah. Um, this is a quote from that speech. Idealism, comrades, is a good thing in proper amount. Too much of it is too much of a too, like too much of a good cold wine, old wine. Mm -hmm. One's liable to lose one's head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, what in terms of the values now of the of the revolution? Right, we've got this where oh well, that's not what we really mean. Let's not try, right? Let's not go too too far in one direction or in, in another direction. Now, on the one hand, it sounds like prudence, except that it's not by any means it has doesn't have anything to do with prudence. But um, the the uh, the uh, he would not be getting this speech. I don't believe at all. If it weren't for the fact that they know that his mistress is the daughter of a factory owner. If it were not for Kira and the knowledge that certain individuals probably had of his relationship with her or suspect of his relationship with her, he would not be getting this little ridiculous uh, card shuffling and tap dance to drum him out of the party. He wouldn't be getting the speech at all. I don't think so. You don't think? Well, I don't. It's not specifically to him. I mean, it's to a whole yeah. whole group, right? So I think that um, there are uh, there, but there are other things going on. It, it, uh, it's basically. I think everybody knows that the revolution has failed. Right, the economy's mm -hmm. collapsed. Um, they're the, the people who have j the jobs don't know what they're what they're doing. You can't get anything, but no one will come in and say this has failed now. So now we're just going to redefine all of yeah. all of the terms. Um, mm -hmm. Right, Michael. The goal was, point. What I thought was interesting was that Andre seems very much like Wyman and at the period of the fountainet that we're reading, in the sense that his inner real life, authentic life, is coming to conflict with the, with the unrealistic uh, social world, the social environment yeah. that they're created yeah. or that they're living in. And it's becoming an internal battle between those values on the superficial outside world. Yeah. This is what I really know to be true. Right? Yeah. And it, it, it seems like a, a very similar, it, the context is slightly different, but the very similar problem in, in construction. 
it's kind of like a a, a, a a more grandiose version of what Anthony Flew called the uh, no true Scotsman maneuver. <laughs> yeah. That is to say, you're reading a newspaper and say, well, no, no Scotsman would, would ever, um, you know, uh, eat haggis uh, with tea. And say, well, here's a Scotsman that eats haggis with tea. He says, I'm no true Scotsman would ever eat haggis with tea. You know, and so re redefinitions. Um, that is, you know, if your if your reality uh, bites you back, that you uh, deny it by recategorizing everything. Adele, what were you going to say? Oh, um, just that the the goalposts are shifting. Exactly that. That they're they're moving the bar from what it used to be to something different. Like, oh yeah, that that. That that kind of communism isn't what we're going for anymore. Now it's a different kind of communism. Right. Yeah. The military communism is starves people. Yeah. <laughs> Practical <laughs> communism. As opposed to unnecessary communism. <laughs> right. Well, I, I find also the play of you know, taking uh, concepts that in one context work perfectly with understanding life and dealing with things like uh, reevaluating oh this doesn't work so we re we we reevaluate the process mm -hmm. we all do that you know well, we tried this but it didn't work but then when you switch the context to it being something that's fundamentally flawed and not challenging that but then when people are stuck with it, like you said, like they're, um, they're ignoring it. Right. Exactly. When the theory has been refuted, okay, uh, I'm a great believer in induction, both in the positive and the negative sense. But when, and in the negative sense, when you have a theory like communism built on nothing, all right, refutes it, you don't say, we're going to make, find another way to make it work and you're going to take it down the throat whether you like it or not and this is what i was getting at uh weeks ago when i mentioned uh open society and its enemies it is not on uh, karl popper was certainly not an objectivist but one thing he understood he saw communism firsthand and he was the one to point out that both Marx and Plato were advocating totalitarianism. And it was being held by its adherents in the same way that religious dogma is being, you know, was held by people. And it was wrong for the same reason. It couldn't and it wasn't scientific. And the, the experience already of the Second World War with Nazism and with the, the rise of the Communist Party from the Bolshevik Revolution, and he saw the, 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 the Communist Revolution in Austria about that time, uh, showed that it, you know, it, it, just, it just wasn't going to work. It was a false, it was a false theory. Right. And uh, you know, he was a democratic socialist, but Marxism was too much. People were getting killed and it wasn't working. And this is the whole point um, that, that getting at what you, you were talking about, Michael, is that the whole the state is basically another character in the book. Because it because it affects everything, everything, every choice. There's yeah. absolutely no choice in the book by any of the characters that it would be made in the absence of that regime. It, artistically, it's very much like an opera where you have yeah. the, the divas and you have yeah. the stuff, but then you also have the chorus. Mm -hmm. So in a yeah. way, the state is the chorus. Yeah. Interesting. We also have a, just a blatant denial of reality here, right? We're just, yes. The facts are all around us. 
and we're just not going to see them. We're just going to call things other things. We're going to call failure success. We're just going to kill the people that are bothering us who are insisting that things are are otherwise. So a, a, a very violent and um, delusional in the way um, it, it, it's depicted here. Um, so then, um, so let, let's move, let's move on from, from that. So now, Mar Marilyn, oh, sorry, Marilyn, you want to comment? Do you, do you also think that maybe some of the party members have seen a change in Andre and realize that he might be on a different path than them, but on a better path? Like happy, you mean? Yeah, like happy. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that he, that he, in and of his own mind, is is a better person because of the way he thinks about things, mm -hmm. and maybe they're jealous of Andre and his, and his making a better person and a better life for himself, rather than, rather than living the life that they are living, and not having anything to eat. I mean, it's like it seems to me that. That Andre has kind of surfaced as a as a better person at this point, and maybe his comrades are recognizing that and and are jealous of him. I yeah, think it's really so. interesting. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, they they um, Andre has uh, been, I would say, almost transformed by the relationship with Kira. I agree. And uh, that people don't hide that very well. And uh, it would be impossible to imagine uh, certain people that work with Andre, you know, up close and personal in the party. Uh, it would be impossible to imagine them not noticing it. It's interesting well, to oh go ahead Michael. Well there's also the passage where Sonia is asking him well what did you think about this and he says I don't want to discuss it which is a flag. Yeah if, right if, right if he was on the yeah. bandwagon plane right. he would say oh it was wonderful and blah 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 and he would have lied through his teeth to be part of them. Right but yeah he'd be was, regurgitating all of the all of the the platitudes that they're expected to regurgitate mm. right so that so he actually sent a flag that i was surprised by because i thought he would just go into the party mode right and, i did oh, too uh oh <laughs> idealistic yeah <laughs> right well so andre has been a target throughout the novel i mean even from the very beginning he has been targeted because of his integrity even in the pod in the party you know Sonia and Pavel, they have always been watching him basically because he can't be, be corrupted. And now that everyone is, is corrupted, and um, as you've all pointed out, I think, you know, even though his, um, his life has improved because he's um, assimilated these, these new values, those are the values that are going to destroy him now. I agree. Yeah, and, and that's also um, he was a representative of the ideal party, and then and then so Rand is even showing that idealism is almost good no matter what stance you take because eventually it leads you towards maybe correcting mistakes because you want to have it be yeah it's just right. Fun. And then, and then later he gets visited by his friend who was like a, a an army buddy or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a really that good point. That is a really good point, and uh, and I agree with you about that. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say that in Andre's idealism makes him more likely to change as a person than Leo. Leo's not going to change. I agree, Charles. Yeah. I think I think Leo is Leo. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's not 
he's not of a mind to change or or relinquish any of his any of his of his activities yeah, or it, duties. It's kind of a anything. fixed trait thinking. You know, this is what I am. Take yeah. it or leave. This is what yeah. I am. Adele, yeah. your face just spoke volumes. <laughs> It was it was actually really interesting because I was I was reading the chapters aloud to my boyfriend while while I was preparing for the for the session. I, mm -hmm. I we just gotten back from the festival and we we wanted to I, I wanted to read the chapters beforehand. He was like, oh yeah, read them aloud to me. And his perspective was was really interesting. It was something I hadn't thought about before. As somebody who hasn't read Ayn Rand before, he was saying, well, is he okay with this system just because he's getting money now? And I didn't think that really covered Leo's thoughts about the whole situation. To me, Leo's thinking is more about him being defeated by the system rather than yeah. being like, okay, I can get by well enough in this system. It's more about him sacrificing his principles and this slow moral decay that he's going through. I think so. And it's also human nature when you see people that are becoming drug dealers or they pimps or something like that and how flamboyant they are with their money or they just throwing it away. Mm -hmm. Silly stuff. They're not, they're uh, not yeah, this, this, this no. reminds me of something that David Kelly wrote in an article. Uh, I don't know where it was, maybe Reason or something uh, back at the end of the 80s describing the the, the boom and it said he said the easy money uh uh begets uh that was the right verb uh easy virtue <laughs> and that's what's happening you know here so well i also think with that money with him with uh leo he doesn't um he's not thinking about about the future Mm -hmm. um, he's not thinking, uh, I'm going to put this away, uh, Kira and I can get out of here, or something like that. Right. He has not, um, he seems to have uh, abandoned any kind of hope um, in that right. regard. And so I, I, I agree with, with Adele in, in, in that part. But he's also risking his life. I mean, you know, he doing what he's doing, he's putting his life on the line. He is, but he's also going he on the record can, saying, I'm not risking very yeah. much in doing that. Right. Yeah, I know. And if if he gets caught, he's dead or in prison. So. But he, I, is, he is making the comments to Kira like, here, this is for our rescue or this is for our. our, our right. Our, yeah. To go to go out out of uh, Russia. So he's he has this little, even when he's drunk, he has this little moment like, keep the money, hide it from me. So I, he, I just hope, I hope she doesn't lose her skirt. <laughs> well, you know, he said, let me say, he, he says he wants to go to Europe with her, but he doesn't mean it. Mm -hmm. He says it because he she knows that's what he wants. That's he knows that that's what she wants to hear. Go ahead, Adele. I'm sorry, Adele. Go ahead. No, it's it's fine. I I think that that was a big theme of these these chapters that we read for today was was the focus on not thinking about the future on not planning ahead because it's it's pointless. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that that's where Leo's coming from. There's no point in thinking about the future. There's no point in trying to escape. There's no point in trying to get out of here. This is the reality we have to deal with. It's it's a day to day thing. It's just trying to survive. You know, this is a little bit on the side, but what I'm finding so amazing about reading the Fountainhead and We the Living Back to Back and and thoroughly is is the empathy that Rand has for how the human system works. You know, ha having your ideals and having freedom and having uh, something you love to do and versus like trying to get away with it or living a lie. But mm -hmm. she actually has so much empathy for the problem. Mm -hmm. And also people that can make mistakes. They can pick up on a lie and they don't know it's a lie, but they're investing in yeah. it. The path yeah. doesn't lead to where they hope it's going to lead. Yeah. And I'm finding that 
that all of these characters and the moments of empathy, you know, a con artist or something is trying to get away with something, but they have a moment of seeing the truth and how all yeah. of a sudden it's so beautiful. That little moment is like precious. And I'm, I, I don't recall reading other writers that do it that well. And I also wonder why people hate her so much. So what is that? in them that hates this kind of you know yeah I, i've thought about that too and uh a lot and i think that it it has to do with the fact that she uh it's almost like she can she has a kind of x-ray vision when she's writing these characters as to what the core issues are and what the premises are whereas other writers just sort of do a little surface dance and don't really get to the heart of it. Not, not this, this isn't, you know, everybody, but she is very, very rare in that respect. Well, um, also, so, you know, yeah. for both of you, it makes me think, you know, when Rand, she genuinely um, admires human beings and, and the human potential. So when people fail or when they're caught in problems like this, she doesn't think, well, oh, that's just the way things are. She does see the real tragedy and the real horror in being yes. in that situation because she knows yes. that humans are better and can can achieve the things that she, right. she talks about. So it is really terrible. And you're right. You do feel that empathy because it reminds you that, um, yes, I can be this kind of person, that this kind of person is, is real. Um, and when they're not able to, to, to do that, it does, it, it, it hurts. Yes, because, you know, she, in the Fountainhead, she had created a, a, the ideal man. And then in Atlas Shrugged, she had created almost an ideal society. Uh, Atlas, I mean, Galt's culture is like a sort of Valhalla. And I think I, I said that to Marilyn uh, some weeks back. Uh, and you pointed out that she felt uh, kind of joyless uh, or drained or kind of depressed after that. And I think one of the reasons was is that she was hoping that for a community like a Gold Gulch, where she was surrounded by first men, first rate minds. Um, and it may have been the shortcoming is that she was supposing that all the first rate minds would just simply agree with her. And um, that doesn't happen. Um, Ralph Rako, who, who passed away uh, last year, uh, told the story and who by the way was a libertarian a friend of Murray Rothbard's but he loved Rand he wasn't so crazy about the people that were the hangers on because he was uh one of the people like uh Henry Hazlitt uh Ludwig von Mises uh Albert J Nock uh those great old libertarians who were very very sympathetic to her and and loved her and all of a sudden they were gone and this extended Canadian family uh, showed up and uh, there just wasn't a place for them. Now that turned out to be the, uh, the Blumenthal's and, and it, you know, it, it, it was important, I think, for the development of objectivism as it happens. But uh, there was a real sense of loneliness, uh, which I think you're getting at, Michael, that she that she felt. And I think that's one reason is that having written the book, having composed her great symphony of hope, uh, there weren't enough people around to understand it. Hmm. Well, Sorry for the that's what, Yeah, The artist's saying is that no one is actually going to understand you as well as you would like them to. Sure. So what you creating a work is you know what's going on, and there is not going to be anyone who's going to get it on your own level. You do. Yeah. And accept it, it's much easier to go go through life and not worry about it. But, right, 
exactly. I mean, it, it's like a great, yeah, trying to explain her work, you know, you either get it, you know, or you don't. And um, they're never appreciated at the time as much. Yeah, it's just unfortunate. Well, let's let's uh, keep appreciating her now. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and let's move on to um, Victor. Um, Victor, Victor at home. Uh, <laughs> so, um, just uh, right. This what his first words. That this is very interesting to me. This. Um, all of the contradictions in, in, in Victor's, in Victor's behavior here with that, those two little words, dinner ready. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ron, what would you like to say? Well, if I treated my wife that way, she'd say, fix your own day <laughs> dinner. <laughs> I, th I think, I think, I think Victor's a scumbag. I just clearly is, and and it shows up at the end of the of the chapter where he disavows his family, and and you know it's just like, what a dirt ball. <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah. that's terrible. We'll get to that. But so here he is. He says, Victor. Uh, Victor says, dinner ready. Right. But so we're in we're in in Soviet Russia. What is in terms of the values of the party and the revolution, what is what is Marisha doing at that point when he comes in? Remember, she's studying. She's, she's studying her cell meeting or whatever it is. Yeah, her communist party group. Right, right, and it's such a mess because she's studying because she's got to give like a lecture on and electricity or something. Yeah. Which she does yeah, not like but but her 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 party duty should come second to the family when that's that's obviously not what the party line is. Exactly. And Victor is supposed to be Mr. Mr. Party, right? Right? Yeah. So clearly he's being shown here as as if we didn't know. But she's he's really being shown here as being completely without principles. Michael? But just before he got burned. He went to get the engineer's job, mm -hmm. and they say, no, 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 you don't quite have the credentials for it. So he was really frustrated that his family was blocking his ascent. Right, right. And what are the so credentials come, that he needs? Yeah. Yes, that he's he needs to be uh, from a lesser accomplished, uh, a lower class of a of a family you can't you just can't acquire those credentials right you, you can't well, you can if you, like, get... but he comes home like they you know like the man the man of the house and is he's, he's demanding demanding dinner so this is very um bourgeois let's say yeah um, <laughs> he's one with the bourgeois ideals <laughs> yeah, you know, I, hey, I'm a party member now. Uh, where's dinner? And you know, get my slippers and that sort of thing. Um, but very true but, in human characteristic. He yes. was frustrated. He comes home. He's the one who's supplying money for everyone. Mm -hmm. Compromising. He's you know doing, and he can say he's doing it for them. Oh. So, and then what? But I'm saying he's. It's this little manipulation thing going on. And then it's like, well, I come home and you're not doing anything for me after I've made these sacrifices. <laughs> right. right. Altruism in, in, in a nutshell. And that thing, why the hell isn't the bed made? Uh, and she goes this long list of like, I'm doing this and I've got this meeting and I've got this to do. and. And, and it occurs to me that the one thing that's going to come back and bite Victor is the fact that uh, party member fine, but the son of a factory owner, son of a you know bourgeois family, and so uh, he's ex he, you know anyone with that kind of background is what would have to be considered um, not quite on the inner circle respect yeah and he obviously has no affection 
for anyone. Yeah. There's no one there in that in that house that he would not throw under the bus. Um, exactly. exactly. But I guess that set up the social conscience of the communist and how to get ahead is impossible unless you have leverage of death over everyone. That ultimately, like at a Turk, Turkey, yeah. revolutionary Turkey, but he killed all his opposition. Well, Michael, even now in mainland China, if you ask too many questions and make trouble, even if you're in the uh, halls of commerce, you disappear. <laughs> you, you don't publicly, you're not publicly executed, you're not sent to a relocation camp, but no one hears from you again. Because it's, because it's, it's what's, you know, how many, God knows how many uh, large the population is, um, everyone is expendable. Right. But Charles, that happens here. Huh? <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that stopped the clock, didn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we have uh, Irina and Sasha again, right? And what what what's up with uh, Victor? And uh, he discovers them and he 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 complains to Irina but remember what is the um the focus of his complaint he doesn't say Irina I'm really worried about you does he they're, they're damaging his reputation right yeah yeah he's worried about himself about what it will do to his standing within the party yeah he already has this bourgeois past. He doesn't want to have to deal with a counter-revolutionary sister. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So he could right. doesn't care about her at all. He doesn't doesn't care about about any of them. And obviously, but, as we see at the end of the next chapter, go ahead. But sympathetically towards him, what's he going to do if he's going to find out that his sister is going to get married to a revolutionary? Right actually trying to stay afloat screwed. that's an interesting point and that goes along with what you've been saying charles is that he in a certain extent he's um he has to make those those choices if he wants to stay and so he's uh just as everyone else is now they're all pitted against each other and um there there's no opportunity for real uh connection or for real uh feeling now everyone yes. is um watching they're 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 spying on each other they're turning each other in right right oh, it's a horrible culture um and then we have our our um uh, sonia and and papa <laughs> Right, you've been chopping at the bit to talk about that. So, uh. well, I I sent Marilyn a, a a Facebook messenger earlier this week about it's literally the first time I laughed in this book <laughs> when Sonia told Pavel that she was pregnant. <laughs> it just be careful who you roll around in a closet with, I guess. But. <laughs> right, right. So and it's such a beautiful story. I mean, let's just go through it. So, so Sonia tells him that she's pregnant. And what does he say? He, he you wants are, it's not mine, right? So again, you know, it's, it's just such a tender love story that we that we too get. much stoli, right, Ron? Yeah, yeah, too much stoli. <laughs> I was drunk. <laughs> How do you know it's fine? Um, right. So uh, just, you know, so very horrible. Uh, clearly what he thinks of her comes out, right? At that point, right? Um, there's no, again, there's no real concern between two people. So then what does she do? And she herself has no real affection for him, right? Nor it doesn't seem for the baby, 
right? So, but how does she, how does she uh, contextualize the child? Well, she Let presents me, it as being a, a party duty. I mean, they have to withhold the morals of the party and they have to get married. And, and I thought it was interesting that Pavel said, well, give me a couple days to think about it. And three days later, they were married. So I don't think Pavel ever got a chance to think about it. I just think it was done. <laughs> well, I think he, whatever Lady Sonia said is that's the way it's going to be. He, he also, like the next day, showed up somewhere and they were already congratulating did it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were congratulating Pavel <laughs> about marrying Sonia. <laughs> But anyone would know that meeting Sonia that heading for a trap. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, Do not go near this woman. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> right. Um, Adele, what were you going to say? Oh, yeah, just just that the Sonia's idea about this baby is is that it's a future citizen to to be indoctrinated into the same sort of system. She doesn't love Pavel. She doesn't love the idealism of communism. She loves the party. That's the difference between her and Andre, or, or Pavel and Andre, is love for more, more, more Sonia than, than, yeah, Pavel. Sonia loves the party. Andre loves the ideals that were supposed to be behind the party. Very interesting. And she, she yeah. also accepts that Pavel is so nasty about it. Like I was drunk, and where was I? And it was three months ago. And why didn't you have an abortion? And he says every single thing that I would think a woman would hope that her father of her child would never say. <laughs> I'm, I'm pregnant, and then he just goes in after every single thing that could say that would diminish your character or really take you down. He does the whole nine yards. And she yeah. just accepts it. It's like, well, okay, we'll just manipulate this even further, mm -hmm. uh, which is extremely cold, extremely really cold. cold, brutal. So right. So, but this is the kind of person now who's going to who's thriving in in this setup. And yes, this child is a, a, a status symbol. It's like a, an insurance policy or, or something, mm -hmm. but. There's no real, um, there's no real ma maternal love. I, 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 I don't get any, any sense of that from her. So uh, again, in terms of the family, there, in terms of a family structure, I, it doesn't seem like, like there really, there, there is, there is one here. It's more of an inconvenience. Well, I, I think I thought it was interesting that when Sonia moved in with Pavel. It looked like she went up a notch because his room was bigger than hers. And, you know, so she kind of gained some status, social status in the, in the mix. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, all right. So then uh, we have that... Uh, Meeting with, that you brought up earlier, uh, Michael with um, uh, Timoshenko oh. and uh, and Andre. Um, um, but then let's move on because it's just getting kind of late. We have we have got Kira in um, chapter chapter seven. Uh, Kira and and Leo together. Um, so what is what is what is going on with that with that relationship? What there's that beautiful part at the beginning where Kira's out and she sees um, somebody there there there's some building going on, and and she's she's standing there and she's um, she's she's watching she's watching all of this, um, uh, and I, I thought that was really well done um, in terms in terms of of literature and, and and characterization. She never says Kira still. She doesn't say Kira still holds um, the the desire the um, and the capacity to be a builder. But she puts her 
in this situation where you get that that feeling my we're curious inside she is an engineer she loves buildings she loves construction yeah. and all that stuff and so she's just absent she's daydreaming she just all of a sudden caught inside the building and there is no she doesn't the soviet government doesn't exist nothing exists just the construction and it's a very true a very true characteristic to people that have a passion for something they can get lost in it yeah and then when the, they wake up to the reality like oh my life didn't turn out that way yeah i almost see her as sort of being just temporarily like knocked back into the reality that she um deserves right mm -hmm. that she would be perfectly mm -hmm. capable in in a world in which she is able to to build and she has she never loses she never loses sight of that and that's something right. very admirable about that character and of course all the more tragic um but the fact that at this point she doesn't she's not jaded right. and there's also the contrast with victor uh, trying to get the engineering job for this huge monumental project where it shows that it's all manipulators getting the jobs. So yeah. then in contrast is an authentic engineer, which is, which is who you need to do those kinds of jobs. <laughs> right. And, and this, this, of course, reminded me of the Fountainhead very much. Um, Kira would, would have uh, done almost anything to become a Howard Rourke. Mm. or to have worked for a Henry Cameron. And um, Victor is uh, like Peter Keating with a gun. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's a foreshadowing of the next book. I, I, I wonder, and I have to, uh, when my eyes are better, I'll, I'll, I'll read up on the background information, but I would be surprised if she weren't already thinking about the Fountainhead while she was uh, writing this one and, um, That's and doing the point. research for it. Right, and remember, she's just, uh, Kira then is just, um, she gets the bums rush, right? The militia man just says, get out of yeah. here. And she says, I was just looking. And he says, you have no business. Is it a jumping head too far to go when the, when she and Leo no. he comes, he comes out of the bathroom or, and then he's like looking, he's looking healthy and normal. And like she was talking about the sunlight glowing off of the, the little, the little, uh, drops of um, water on his shoulders and right. he's like damp from the shower and he kisses her passionately and so what's happening to Kira is that there's a part where she gets lost in looking at the engineering going on then she's making love so it's actually a very strong element of real life value yes that yeah. she's touched by yeah which gives her energy to keep going Yes. Which I think that's an amazing touch of realism of how what a character needs to keep going. Right. Yes. And she can still see, and Adele, you've brought this up too, she can still see that part of Leo that that she loves also. So she has her love for him is um she's she's sustaining it. She's you know got the little twigs and she's trying to keep that those sparks going as it gets harder and harder. But here's another moment of um of where they can both have just uh I think unencumbered affection for each other and it's very touching. Yeah. And there's an interesting point to that. And Rand makes it very specific that that's a moment worth living for. And then, uh, uh, Charles, you brought up the fountainhead, and that's what the fountainhead is. It's the spark. Yes, yeah, yeah, and exactly. Was so adamant about you need those little sparks of you need those moments in life, and they're right. what propel you on. Yeah, and it's interesting because they're not so intellectual. They're not. They're not like understanding something. They're more like 
an experience that is yeah really heartfelt and, right. and those are the moments that we should take to heart that we should remember and we should dwell on and not all of all of the other things those as you said those are the moments that um are worth are worth living for um and here um she doesn't have to uh when at this at this moment there's no need to um ex explain anything there's no rationalizing she still has has this love and she can just they they again they have this um it's a moment of reality of um where they're what who they are and what they want on the inside can be the same on the outside and of course in the novel it's getting those are getting fewer and um more far between but still i i was wondering too about it being here at this point in the novel because it's almost harder to um think about now as as um we uh move toward the uh the climax of this of this as things are are going down to have that again that reminder from a literary point of view well i i think well i don't remember what happened so i don't remember what's going on after these chapters great and so that's handy but it seems to me that it's gearing up for the money's being saved and either you know either it's going to be a super high point and totally tragic um but it seems to me that kira is being prepared for an adventure there's some sparks that still motivate her because if without any sparks or if it's totally gray it, you just dissipate i mean you just you just but but they're showing some really intense high points that I can understand motivating her onto something greater, mm -hmm. even even if it looks horrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting from seeing that little touch. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and how about Leo at this at this point? I know again we're. Um, it's hard to uh, it's hard to deal with Leo, but um, again, we're reminded that uh, she um, she loves something real and mm -hmm. um, and visible in in Leo. She's not deluded um, in in her love. It's it, it's getting harder to find that part of him, um, but it has been it has been there all along. Right. Oh, what do you think? It, it kind of reminds me of what we were talking about yesterday in the Fountainhead group, where Tui is talking about spreading his fertilizer of bullshit all over the place and, and making it impossible for, for great men to, to grow. And that's what's happened to Leo. He cannot survive in such a system. He can't be the person he was meant to be or the person he could have been. And it's, it's just sad to see his slow decay into accepting this kind of system and, and compromising and saying, what else can I do? This is what I have to do. There's there's no future, there's only now, and this is what I have to do now. Yeah. When I think of Leo, I think of someone who is desperately uh, trying to stop sinking in quicksand. Um, because that's the impression I have of him, he's just sort of sinking uh, in, uh, in, to the point of disappearing and he's grasping uh for kira but also for other things to keep uh at least uh head you know the head head above the the quicksand but he's thinking nonetheless and um that might uh be a, a useful image for thinking of the entire family Ron, you've been quiet. What are what are you thinking? Well, I'm not sure that Leo ever knew what his future was. I mean, from the very beginning of the book, I don't think he really knew what his potential was. And I think that he was a, a much stronger person at the beginning of the book than he is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's done a total 
sort of change about the way he thinks about things and the way he acts about things. I mean, when he met Kira, he was attracted to her because she was a strong individual and had goals and ambitions and, and wanted to be more than what, what the system was forcing her to be. And over the course of the book, and I think we talked about this last week, the characters have sort of swapped positions in terms of their, in terms of, I think, in terms of their mental attitude about stuff. And the system has driven them to the point of, what's the point of living if you can't feel alive? You know, it's an old James Bond movie thing, but, but uh, I don't think that any of them really know what their, what their future is because They've never given the. They've never been given the chance to figure that out. Yeah, I, I I never felt that Leo had a very very strong purpose. Or or or, or guiding principle, whereas I felt that way from the beginning with Andre. You knew exactly what he believed. You knew exactly what he uh, what he wanted. Well, um, and I think Kira did too. I think she. Yeah was pretty clear about it but exactly. because she was the daughter of a bourgeois you know that she was denied the opportunity yes yes well leo too was kicked out of school he wanted to study philosophy um and had every every intention of of, of doing so but he um because of his uh family he was yeah. not allowed um and he can't work We've we've we saw that in uh, earlier chapters where they just um, this set things up so that he couldn't 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 get any kind of legitimate at least in terms of the um, the culture the legitimate job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about Victor, I think that that Rand she may have had this in real life with her husband. What's his name? Frank. Frank O'Connor. Um, but. It seems to me that that is is he has a lot of sex appeal. He has charm, and the negatives that come with that. His substance isn't all there, but he's good looking. He has sex appeal. He has charm, and I think Rand saw those as tremendous values. Yeah, it's tremendous. Like, look how beautiful this guy comes into a party, or and it, it, it touches my heartstrings. Mm -hmm. And I think she has. Uh, a profound respect for that as a virtue, as if someone was yeah. uh, very smart at their job or a very diligent yeah. job, but that also charm. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's what... Well, also, he, felt he had very high self-esteem. He was a commanding person, right? And he knew he was Leo Kovalensky. Um, uh, what was based on? See, I think that was based right. on his... Charmist and sex appeal. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But but in a different world, he could have been anything. He could have done anything. He he could have made something of his life if he'd had the opportunity. He's, he's a victim of his circumstance. And he can't be the person he could have been, whatever it might have been. I think that, that if he tried anything, he could have succeeded at it. He's that kind of person. That kind of person. Right. And it's staggering to be to have a world that limits could could possibly limit someone like him, uh, but that's what what's that what they've accomplished. What what I'm also getting at at this point in the book is Rand's brilliance at doing variations on a theme. So the state is overwhelming all these people. It's disrupting everyone. The mm. ideal pragmatists, yeah, BS people, the evil people. Everyone is getting trashed, mm. and. And it's all variations of their characters and the way they think. So the theme is that you're getting trashed, but she's doing it in so many different ways with so many different types of characters. Yes. And I find the imagination for that yeah. a lot to take in. I mean, there's like 25 people that are all being um, yeah. under I was pointing out to Marilyn actually before we 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 started uh, recording that um, for uh, an author who hated tragedy, who including including authors of the Western canon, 
who were uh, writing tra tragedy, I might add. This woman could phone it in. I mean, she was just an absolute master. And, and she knew this stuff firsthand, obviously. She did. It's just amazing. It is. And the fact that she has that many characters and everyone is equally well drawn. You never get yeah. the sense of having one that was just there as a sort of a, a stock character. Even if they're acting in terms of being a foil, you still connect. You still um, recognize them as an individual. And I think it's amazing, her, her powers of character. Yeah. Well, we only have a few minutes left, and I do want to get to that horrible um, scene at the end of, of Chapter 7. So we've got um, – well, I wanted to point out, too, um, I mentioned if you read spy novels, if you've ever read a spy novels, that, that's the suspense of um, where Sasha is out on the street, and there are all of the, the signals in the, in the windows and at the doors, and just in, in terms of um, – Suspense and intrigue is very well done. Do you agree? Yes. yes yeah. Oh, yeah. Pick up the phone and the wrong person answers, calling up someone else doesn't answer, and the, the thing in the, the right. base. Yeah. You know, yes. Mm -hmm. And then also his help, the little girl being, warning him, like, don't, right. don't. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little um, human touch. Very yes, it was, and you just really got a sense of the Cold War, though, and the danger, and of those uh, of, yeah. just, of that um, inability to uh, know who who to who to who to trust. And it was very quickly done. It was only a few paragraphs, right? Right, right. It was yeah. well, I, very I found big. myself. Yeah. Thinking, Gosh, yeah. I wish you had written a spy novel. It would have been, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> been right. great. Right. All about Sasha. Yeah, it could have been a whole novel about Sasha. I love Sasha. I'd be happy to read a novel about Sasha. <laughs> I agree. Are you a writer? Hmm? Are you a writer? I'd kind of like to be. I, I, I guess that. You're kind of like, well, I could read that. You know. So I was like, well, thank you for sure. <laughs> All right, so Sasha and uh, Irina are in love, for real. It's uh, real love, right? And so there is that um, kind of parallel, too. I think they're, they're parallel to um, Kira and, and Leo. They're sort of lesser characters. Mm -hmm. Neither of them has, has the strength um, that, that Kira and Leo have. And um, so what we have here, I, I think, is... Um, uh, sir, some some commentary again on on what happens to people, and then we have that incredibly disgusting uh, act by by Victor. Uh, in which he um, he turns him in, he turns him over, and um, and the well, arena with him. Huh? And Irina with him. Right. His sister. Irina is his sister, right? And he says, yeah. well... Yeah. Uh, and this, this was quite common, by the way, uh, during those years. Um, really, Charles? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's absolutely really? different. Well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, okay, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, thank you, Charles, for pointing out the obvious. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no. But, I, yeah. I, I meant it. I meant it sincerely. I mean, it, was it really common for? Yeah, it was common. Family and, members to undo other family yes. members, and at yes. that time they. It, it was also uh, common uh, in the days of the Cultural Revolution in uh, Mao's China. Uh, it, all the time. Mm. All the time. Right. Uh, so he does this and then he, he just, you know, hands her over. Um, who else is responsible? No one. Just my sister. Um, just, I mean, if her, his sister were a homicidal maniac, maybe you, you turn her in. But um, this is not what, so this is, is, is so depraved. And then his last words. The only value of my example is in showing our party that the family is an institution of the past, um, which should not be considered when judging a member's loyalty to our great 
collective. So here's uh, he takes this depravity and he tries to turn it into a a virtue. What's the rationality of an evil regime? So people will rationalize it to survive, or they make mm -hmm. up stories in their head. But it, it it's amazing, yeah. it's actually true of human nature. Yeah, amazing that 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 humans would actually take that step. And they do. And they do. It's, it's, it's fear. Uh, and uh, no one wants to be turned over. So one strategy is to be the pit bull and turn other people over. Right. Um, Interesting. So, but this yeah. is where we are. This is what has been created now. This is what has the 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 the, evol the revolution has has uh, devolved into. Mm -hmm. Right. It shows that this is the ultimate sacrifice or the ultimate evil. Yes. And that's that's what Andre says. He says that that maybe that there there could be no other way that this could end. He admits that to Kira. He's seen what's happened and he kind of is starting to understand that this is the natural logical consequence to his ideals yes yes yeah yes why don't we end on that that's a little yes. bit of a low note but that's where we are and we'll pick this up again next week it was great talking to you everybody yes great. thank you everyone thank you marilyn Bye -bye. thank you thanks guys